freedom. Okay? So you have that number now. So if you, know, if you had 10 samples, degree of freedom is 9. Then you calculate this value here, 1 half 1 plus sigma. Uh, is that sigma? What is that thing? What is it? Gamma. Gamma, <laughs> sorry. They never let me in any fraternities, obviously. <laughs> um, all right, so 1 plus gamma here. So once you know gamma, you can calculate this thing, right? So if this is 0.95, I think that ends up being 0.975, that F value, okay? Then the idea is you have to look in the table, okay? And I'm going to attempt to draw kind of what the table looks like, at least I think what it looks like. So you have a table that will give you, um, let me think here. Okay, so it kind of looks like this. It gives value of F here, and then it gives different degrees of freedom, like, you know, M equal 1, M equal 2. It may not look exactly like this. And then in this table, it has the, all these C values. So you have to look up what the value F is here, what the number of degrees of freedom is, and find the value associated with those. Okay? So I'll show you how to use it in a minute, but again, I don't have access to show you the table that easily. But you should look at the table when you look at your book, and you'll see that in order to pick the C value out, it's called the critical value, you need to know the value of the function F, that's the value of the T distribution, okay? with a certain number of degrees of freedom. So once you know F, which you'll know if you specify gamma, and once you know M, which you'll know because you know the number of samples, you can find this value C from the table. Okay? All right, so once you've got the value C, um, then what you're going to do is you're going to calculate, well, at this point it says the mean or the variance. Uh, you, well, I guess you do need the mean and the variance. Okay, so take your samples that you have available to you, Calculate the mean, you know, the x bar. Calculate the variance, you know, the s squared of those samples. And then you can compute the confidence interval like this. You calculate this value k. You take the c value you obtain from the table. You multiply it times the standard deviation, s, you know, square root of s squared. And then divide by the square root of n. Okay? And then you can write the answer like this, okay? So the me mu means the true mean. So what we're trying to say is that we know the true mean to some confidence. So 95% confident that the true mean is between these two limits. The lower limit is the mean you calculate from the samples minus this value k, and the upper limit is the mean plus k, okay? So you can see a couple of things here from this equation. First of all, as the standard deviation increases, that means the variance, you know, the variability in the data, these ranges are going to get larger. You become less confident. And you can see that it helps to have more samples, but not like you'd like, right? So this k value square, um, scales is the square root of, of n. That means if you want this to be twice as confident, you need 10 times the number of samples. It's unfortunate. It's the way it is. Okay? All right, and in the book, although <laughs> we don't care about it because we don't really consider this case, they have another procedure like this, assuming you know the sigma, okay? So in other words, a case where you have a Gaussian distribution, you don't know the mean, but you do know the sigma. That's not usually the case, so I don't even talk about it. But you, in the book, it does have that case, okay? So now what I'll do is I'll go through a little example of how you go about using this particular method. And so... Again, this is one of my uh, polymer molecular weight problems. So we have making a polymer, we're measuring the molecular weight, we're getting, I think this is 10 samples. You know, this one is 1.25 times 10 to the plus fifth, um, gr you know, grams per mole. So it's the molecular weight measured 10 times in 10 independent experiments. And we want to know, we want to calculate the mean of this. And at this point, I'm, I'm not even going to, show you the calculation, everyone can calculate the mean of this thing, okay? Now, um, we're not really doing MATLAB right now, but la in, in an ironic twist of fate, my son is taking statistics as a senior. What a lucky kid, you know? It's like, Dad, can you help me with the statistics? I'm just like, how about I just do it for you? Um, <laughs> 
So last night he comes up with a set with a homework and it involves take calculating the mean and the, the, the variance of uh, 65 samples. So I'm like, just go ahead and give that to me, son. Put it, <laughs> put it in a big v vector like this. See, 65 cent. Can you imagine using, the, you remember the equation for calculating the variance? Subtract every sample from the mean, square it, and add them up 65 times. I'm like, we don't do that in this family, son. <laughs> um, we do that. Okay. So he, he pretended to calculate it. Okay. Don't, don't tell his teacher. All right. Um, so I'm, I'm just mentioning this because if you, if you have any problems, I think all the homework problems are really easy in the sense they're small. But, and we're going to talk about all this, but you know, you can, you can go into MATLAB and calculate the mean and the variance and the standard. If you wanted, I think this is the variance. I've got to be careful. It might be something else, but let me see. Yeah. So, you know, you can, you, we can do, we'll do all the stuff in MATLAB and I'll show you how. It's just now that if you were to have a large data set and you want to calculate the variance, you can just enter it as some big long vectors. You can see I did for the homework <laughs> last night. Um, and then you can calculate it in MATLAB. Nobody wants to square 65 values. Give me a break. I'm just like, tell your teacher not only are you going to get 100, but this is a stupid question. All right. That's a great attitude to tell your, your kid. Whatever. Okay. Okay, so this is easy. So, you know, I'm just telling you, when I do these calculations, I, I never calculate this by hand. What a waste of time. I enter a vector with those 10 values and I use MATLAB, but these are the numbers I get. If you calculate them by hand or with MATLAB, you'll get the same thing. So there's your estimate of the mean. That's your estimate of the variance. Um, so now you want to know how confident are you that that is the mean, okay? So I'm going to do the, calculate the confidence intervals. To do that, I have to specify a, a Confidence level, I'll pick the normal value, which is 0.95, 95% confidence. Calculate the degrees of freedom. Okay, degrees of freedom is number of samples, which is n, I mean, yeah, n, which is 10 minus 1, 9. And then if you calculate this thing, you might recall it's 1 half, 1 plus gamma. It ends up being 0.975 if you go back and look at the equation. Now I have to use the table. I know the value of the t distribution equals 0.975. I know that the degrees of freedom is 9. I look in the table and get 0.226. Okay. So if you want to learn how to use the table, just figure out how I got 0.226 for this example, and then you can do any other example you want. All right? Okay. So then you want to calculate this value k. If you remember what it is, you take the c value right there. You multiply by s, not s squared. So I have to take the square root of this to get s. And then you divide by the number of samples, square root of the number of samples, and you get that. And then the 95% confidence limit then is that x bar minus that number, that's that, and the x bar plus that number, that's that. Okay. So this says you're 95% confident that the true mean is between 1.21 and 1.31 times 10 to the fifth, which I didn't write, but you know. So that means if you're trying to make a polymer, for example, that had a molecular weight of 1.2, times 10 to the minus fifth, it's, it's pretty plausible. This isn't the best way to answer that question. I'll, I'll tell you how to c answer that question. Use something called a hypothesis test. But it gives you some, some measure that's, I think, a lot more useful than just the value of the mean. It tells you the, what the mean is and how confident you are in the mean as well. Okay? One thing you can be pretty sure is that values of the molecular weight out below that and above that are not very likely. They're not impossible, but they're not, they're not likely. Okay. All right, so then I wanted to show um, something about the effect of the sample size on the, your ability to do this. Okay, so I just said, let's say we have a set of measurements, which I don't give you in this case. They have a mean of one and they have a, a variance of 0.1. So the sample, crap, <laughs> X bar, Sorry, I shouldn't say that word. Darn, X bar. It should be X bar there, not mu. Mu is the true mean. I don't know it. X bar is the sample mean. Okay, so it should be X bar. Sorry. Sample variance 0.1. Okay. I'm making a somewhat not entirely reasonable assumption, but I'm doing it to prove a point. Let's say that I can keep adding samples and it has no effect on the estimate of the mean or the estimate of the variance. It just increases the number of samples, has no other effect. Okay? Obviously, 
if I have a data set and I get more samples and I add them to my data set, it's liable to change the estimates of the mean and the variance. But for simplicity, I'm assuming that's not the case. Okay? And then I'm asking this question. I'm saying, let's say that I want this. I want, I want to determine the number of samples that would be required so that I'm 95% confident the mean is between these two limits. You get, get the idea? It's a little bit different than the other problem. The other problem, I specified everything and I calculated these limits. Now I'm specifying the limits and asking you how many samples do I need to get those limits. And to make the problem tractable, I'm making this assumption here that the x bar and sigma, <laughs> x bar and sigma aren't, aren't changed. Okay? So what do I do here? Well, I take a number of samples, let's say six. I calculate the number of degrees of freedom, which is five. I know that function f here is 0.975 because it's still 95% confidence level. Then I look up the value of c for that, particular, for that particular combination of f and m, and I find it's equal, the, okay, I get the value c, and then I calculate the value k with this equation. So I'm just doing the same calculation repeatedly, but I'm picking the value of n here. Um, and so when I pick the value of n, it changes the number of degrees of freedom. That changes the value of c, and that changes the value of k, all according to the calculations shown here. Okay? And what I have here is that, right, I calculated the mean to be 1. So if I want the limits to be 0.9 and 1.1, that means I need that k to be 0.1 or less, right? Because you can see over here, x bar minus k, that's 0.9, that's x bar plus k, that's 1.1. So I need the k to be 0.1. If it's less, that's okay. I just don't want it to be greater. Okay, so you can do the same thing by t taking n equals 7. So you get 6 degrees of freedom. If you look up in the table now, you get a value of c that's 2.45, and now you get a value of k that's, that's less than that. Okay, and it keeps getting less. The point is, the, the more samples you get, the smaller k becomes. But it doesn't become small fast because it's scaled by the square root of, of n, not, not by n itself. So the answer to this question would be, I need at least seven samples in order to satisfy this requirement. Okay? So in other words, if I want a 10% you know, either direction confidence level in the mean, I need about seven samples. In a minute, I'll do the same thing for the variance and show you you need a lot more. Okay. So here's the recipe for baking a cake called the confidence interval on the variance, okay? Same kind of idea. We assume we have a normal distribution. We don't know the mu. We don't know the sigma. We calculate a, we specify a confidence level, 95%, 90%, whatever, okay? Then we need to calculate these critical values, C1 and C2. Now we use the other distribution, right? The T distribution, confidence interval for the mean, chi-squared distribution for confidence interval on the variance. So again, degrees of freedom is n minus 1. n is the number of samples. We calculate these two quantities. So you know your confidence levels. So you can calculate this. Same thing here. Cal calculate that. And now you need to pick two values out of the table, C1 and C2. Just like um, we picked off one value for the, for the mean test, now you need two values. So fa find out what the f is equal to. You know what the number of degrees of freedom is. Find the corresponding C, C1 for this and C2 for this. This will give you two values, okay? Okay, now if you haven't already done so, calculate the variance of the sample, the S squared. Okay. Then calculate these two quantities, K1 and K2. To calculate K1, you need to know the number of samples. You need to know the, the estimate of what the variance is, right? That's right, you calculate that right there. You need this value C1 that you got from the table. That gives you K1, that's the upper limit. Then you calculate a K2, it's very similar, except you divide by C2. That's the number you got from that. That gives you the lower limit. So once you've done this, you're going to be able to say, I'm 90, let's say 95% confident that the true variance is between this range. Okay. And what you'll find is that the ranges for variance tend to be a lot greater than the ranges for the mean. So, sorry if you're writing, but for this example here, we had 10 samples, and I would argue we had a pretty tight confidence level on the mean here, pretty confident of its value, okay? We'll do a, we'll do a same, I think it's the same example, and we'll find we'll actually get a much wider confidence level or region 
interval on the, um, on the variance, okay? So, so again, similar procedure, except you need to calculate, get two values of C out of the table, C1 and C2, use them in these equations, that's it, okay? So let's see how you do it. Same data set, I believe. In fact, I know. So if you want to calculate the confidence interval, first thing you do is specify the confidence level, 95%. Calculate number of degrees of freedom, 10 minus 1, 9. If you calculate this quantity for 0.95 there and 0.95 there, you'll see F of C1 equals that value and F of C2 equals that value. Then you go into the table, find when the chi-square distribution equals that for 9 degrees of freedom and equals that for 9 degrees of freedom. That'll give you the value C1 and C2. Okay. So again, if you want to know how to use the table, just go in the table and figure out how I got these two values. And then you, you'll see how it's done. All right, so that gives you your C1 and C2 values. There's your S squared. We calculated it already, but it's the, just the variance of those samples. Plug the information into the equation, right? This is um, N minus 1. Is that what it was? Sorry. Uh, yep, sorry. N minus 1 multiplied by the S squared, divide by, in this case, the C1 to get the K1. Do the same thing over here for K2, except you divide by the C2 to get that interval. That is the lower limit. That's the upper limit. I, I rounded it off a bit and got this. Okay. So in other words, I'm 95% confident the true variance is in this range. Hopefully you can appreciate this range is really large. It's, a, it's an order of magnitude difference between the lower limit and the upper limit. So this, uh, this tells you a valuable lesson. If you want to be confident of the variability of a system, you need a lot more than 10 samples. <laughs> okay. 10 samples is enough to compute the mean. It's not really enough to get any confidence about the variability. Okay. You, you want to know something about the variance, you need a lot more samples. I would use, say, about 50, 50 samples or something like that. Okay. So this just says, you know, you can report the value. That's fine to report the value of the variance, but this is useful because it tells somebody that's looking at the information you're providing that you don't have a lot of confidence in it. Like it's caveat emptor. You guys know Latin? No? Let the buyer beware. Anyway, go ahead. You have a question? Yes. Uh -huh. No, you, you choose one gamma, okay? Yeah, but there's two different equations to calculate FC1 and FC2. And then you get two values of C. Okay. So again, this will be a, a lesson that will be pervasive as we talk about statistics is that variance is hard to accurately estimate, estimate unless you have a lot of samples. Okay? And you'll see that here as well. Okay? So this is the same problem kind of for the variance that I did for the mean. I'm saying, let's say that you have a mean equal to 1 and you have a variance, huh, errors tend to propagate, that x bar equal 1, variance equal 0.1. I want to assume that x bar and s squared are unchanged by the addition of samples. So in other words, I have this mean from the samples and this variance from the samples. Doesn't matter how many samples I have, it's not changing. It's not very realistic, it simplifies the problem. Okay. And what I want you to do is the following. I want you to tell me when you can satisfy this. So this is similar to the other case, right? This is like a 10% error, if you will. Remember the last time I had a mean of 1 and I wanted to know when it would be between 0.9 and 1.1, like 10% error. I want to be 95% confident it was in that plus or minus 10% range. Now I want to be 95% confident this is again like 10%. I don't care if that variance is too small, right? Like if someone is making something for you and they say, I got bad news, the variability is less than you thought. You're like, I don't give it. Uh, <laughs> okay, that's fine, you say. Um, it's when the variance is too great is when you care, right? The mean lower limit and upper limit matter, but for variance, the lower limit doesn't usually matter. Because you usually don't want variability. So if it's too low, you don't care. It's just if it's too high. So I'm putting an upper bound on it, like 10%. And I, that means the K11 here, right, if we look at the formula, Sorry, K11. K1, we want to be 0.11 or less. Less is fine. Okay? All right. So then I, g I do the same kind of analysis. I pick a number of samples. I find the M value. I find the... Oh, God. <laughs> Supposed to be C1. 
It's what happens when you do things for the first time. You'd like to think professors make no mistakes, but you know better. All right, I got several corrections to make and I'll repost these. So that should be C1. So I pick a value of n, I pick a value of m, I use this equation right here to calculate a C1, and then I use this equation uh, right here to calculate a corresponding K1. Okay? And if I do that for this problem with 10 samples, I get 0.33. That's a lot bigger than 0.11, so that's not nearly enough. Okay? So then I go up to 100. You might say, why do I go 101? Because the table reports things with degrees of freedom, and it has a value for 100. So I pick 101 samples to get 100 degrees of freedom. Then I can look that up in the table. It gives me a C2 value of that. And that's still not enough. It's still too big. So at this point, um, I don't know if the table goes beyond that. It does have an entry for infinite number of samples, which I didn't bother using. But so this said, if you wanted to satisfy this confidence level, you'd need to do more than 100 experiments. I didn't tell you how many, but it's more than 100. So you get the idea over here for the mean, we could satisfy a similar 10% range here with just seven experiments. And when you get to the variance, you want 10% range like this, you need, more, you need more than 100 experiments. So very hard to get a tight confidence level on the variance. You need lots of samples, okay? Lots of samples, okay. I think we have two more slides, yay. We always get out of here early. Usually when I teach, I try to crush in a ton of information and then right at the end, I'm like racing through the last two or three slides. And after 22 years of doing this, I got the idea, maybe students don't like that, you know? <laughs> so um, I tried to de-densify the slides, put less on the slides, have less slides so that I wouldn't get in that position. So it gives us a chance to chat after class if you'd like to come chat with me. Okay, so now the final material here is on something called the central limit theorem, okay? This is something, we're not going to go through, you know, all the mathematics of this, but it gives some theoretical justification for us always using a normal distribution. So everything we're going to do for all the statistical tests, essentially, we, we use, we're going to assume a normal distribution. And then the question is, well, what if the data is not from our normal distribution? Or, you know, because you don't know that. Um, you don't know if the data is from a normal distribution. There is something in the book that I didn't have a chance to cover, but one of the sections in the book in chapter 25 is how to test if a data set looks normal or not, which I didn't have a chance to cover. But typically, you get data, you don't know if it's from a normal distribution or not. So then the question is, should you be using tests that assume a normal distribution if you don't even know that no data comes from a normal distribution? Okay? And that's where the central limit theorem comes in. It justifies the application of methods to any other distribution you want as long as the sample size is large. So in other words, if the sample size is sufficiently large, you don't need to worry if it comes from a normal distribution or not. Okay. No, but if you have 10 samples, you might want to worry. Okay. But this just gives you some idea that the limit of large sample sizes, um, you can go ahead and use tests for normal distributions without any real concerns. And you know how math works, right? When they mean large, they mean infinitely large. That's the way math works. So the <laughs> way we practically use this is we get a feeling, I think I use the term warm, fuzzy feeling, that if the sample size is large enough, there should be no problem using these type of methods. If the sample size is l small and it really doesn't come from a normal distribution, we may get bad answers, okay? All right, so this is just some underlying math here. Okay, so you have a group of variables, x1, xn. These are random variables. They're independent of each other, so they're independent random variables. They all have the same mean and the same variance, we're assuming. And then we're interested in forming a variable called y, n. It's the sum of all these random variables together. Then you can prove, which we don't, that the mean of this thing is n times mu, and the variance of this variable y is n times sigma squared. Okay? All right. So if these things are normal, you see, uh, hopefully you know a, a, a variable can be random, but it's not normal. Like it can follow some other distribution than a normal distribution. So if we say something's a random normal variable, we mean it's a random variable that comes from a normal distribution. So if these things are also normal, then not surprisingly, if you add normal variables up, the result is another normal, normally distributed variable. Not, shouldn't be hard to see that or appreciate that. Okay, so now you'd like to calculate this quantity, okay? 
It's a variable called z. So you take that variable y and you subtract off n times mu, okay, where mu is the true mean. And then we divide by sigma times the square root of n. Okay? All right. And the idea here is that um, we're interested in the statistical properties of this variable z. Okay. So this is what the central limit theorem here um, portends. Okay. It says, so zn is asymptotically normal. <laughs> I feel like I'm asymptotically anormal, actually. But what does this mean? This means in the limit as asymptotically means in the sense of getting a large number of samples. Okay? So it's saying, I don't care what Zn is. If you get enough samples, it starts to look more and more normally distributed, this variable Zn. Okay? This variable have zero mean and unity variance. And this is the strict definition of what they mean. Okay? So this, as you get a large number of samples, okay? then this variable here follows a distribution function, this is actually a cumulative distribution function here, that you remember this cumulative distribution function? This is the, the standardized normal distribution, cumulative normal distribution. So all this is trying to communicate to you is that if you have a variable, okay, that um, <coughs> is randomly distributed and you get a large number of samples, then whatever the distribution function that governs that random variable starts to look more and more normal as you get more and more samples. Okay. So all that is nice. What's the implication of this? It says you can use confidence intervals tests or any tests that assume a normal distribution for that matter. Even if the distribution is non-normal or more accurately if you just don't know what it is. Okay. As long as the sample sizes are sufficiently large. Okay. And, and this is one of the limitations of this kind of analysis, right? This assumes infinite number of samples. So in the book, they give these guidelines. So they say, what, what's sufficiently large? Where they say, well, for calculating confidence intervals on the mean, you know, 20 is sufficient. And then for the variance, 50. So in other words, even if the data does not come from a normal distribution, if you have 20 or more of the samples, it doesn't make any difference. Same thing for the variance. Even if the data doesn't come from a normal distribution, if you have 50 or more samples, don't worry about it. Okay? This does warn, again, an additional um, warning about small sample sizes. Right? We already said, oh, we don't like this kind of thing because this will give us big confidence intervals if we have a small number of samples. That's bad. But what this is telling you is if you have a small number of samples, the test itself may not be applicable. Not only may you not like the answer, the answer may not be right. Okay? So small sample sizes are bad for a couple of reasons. They not only give you lack of confidence in the value you obtain, but the actual confidence intervals might be wrong. There's a difference between not liking something and then being wrong. <laughs> okay. I don't like those values there. They're too big, but they, if they're wrong, it's even worse. Because that means the results um, are very misleading, potentially. OK, so that's it. Got 10 minutes early. So um, I will see you next Tuesday. And there's a homework due Tuesday. Help session t Sunday and um, Monday nights.